good afternoon and welcome at the Bali and also for the people watching from home through the live stream, a warm welcome. Welcome at the program, uh, who's next? Eastern Europe asking. The war in Ukraine has abundantly ma made us clear that we have not been listening enough to warnings that the states bordering Russia have issued for years. Now, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, everyone from the Baltics to the Caucasus and from Belarus to Kazakhstan is asking, who's next? My name is Jelle Bars, and I will be speaking this afternoon with four distinguished journalists uh, who have been reporting from the region for years. Um, in this roundtable, we'll discuss two topics. How does the recent invasion reverberate in post-Soviet countries? And what narratives do we need to tell to do justice to the experience lived in those countries and gain insight into the current geopolitical situation in Europe? I will first introduce my four guests. The first uh, guest here is on my left is Floris Ackermann, a traveling correspondent and freelance journalist with a special interest in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Um, and you write for uh, various papers like NRC, The Standard, also VPRO and Reformatorisch Dagblad. It's difficult, right? <laughs> difficult name. <laughs> Not a very uh, famous newspaper. No, but, but uh, nonetheless a good newspaper. <laughs> uh, you just went to uh, Ukraine, right? Yes, uh, yes. You just came back, you told me two weeks ago. Correct. Um, where have you been and how is the situation now in Ukraine uh, after three months of war? I've been in Dnipro, Zaporizhia, it's more in the middle and the south of Ukraine, and to the Donbass, the eastern mm -hmm. Ukraine, part of eastern Ukraine. Um, yeah, that's, uh, let's put it that way, that's, uh, um, if I was, I, I spoke with the soldiers over there, they were very confident because they see that the Russian army is not that strong, mm -hmm. they see they kicked them out at Kiev and also uh, around Kharkiv, so you feel uh, confidence on that side of of, uh, of the of, of, of this of this war, and they were also confident enough to we ha we are ready for a counterattack. Okay. So in this case, you see a lot of confidence uh, within the uh, uh, although uh, these Ukrainian soldiers. On the other hand, you see all kinds of problems with fuel. You can only tank for 10 liters fuel, so you cannot travel from A to B in Ukraine very uh, smoothly. Yeah. Uh, so you, you also can you meet uh, refugees from Mariupol at uh, Zaporizhia. They are just coming from Azovstal, and they are terrified and trying to find a new way to, to rebuild their life. So on the other hand, you see all kinds of, of emotions right now in Ukraine. Yeah. A lot of trauma, I can yes. imagine. Yes. On my right, we have uh, Natalia Antelava. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. Uh, she's a journalist from Georgia, a uh, former BBC foreign correspondent for the Caucasus, Central Asia, Middle East, India, and also Washington, D.C., right? A lot of things. Uh, you're also the co-founder and CEO and editor-in-chief of Coda Story, <laughs> which is an award-winning non-profit newsroom with the mission of bringing context and continuity to coverage of global events and also fight against disinformation. Um, Natalia, um, since the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of interest in Ukraine and, and, and the region. Um, what do you try to do with Coda Story? What are you guys trying to add and what are you doing differently than the traditional media? So uh, we are, um, our editorial process is actually very different from you know the usual uh, news newsroom uh, because we're a thematic newsroom, and what we try to do is look at the um, roots of global crises. So. Um, you know, it happened, we cover, the main overarching themes that we cover are authoritarian tech, the abuses of technology, mm -hmm. um, and whether technology is actually helping autocrats rather than helping democracy spread. Um, it's also disinformation, and within disinformation we look at different sort of streams of uh, um, currents that they run through the, the, that overarching big disinformation crisis that all countries around the world experience today, um, and war on science, you know, the advance of pseudoscience and so on. So it's, um, it's both, um, these topics are defined quite broadly, but they also give us um, an ability to focus on certain, uh, certain themes. And um, during the, when the pandemic hit, you know, it hit right in the inter intersection of the themes. And once again, when the Ukraine war happened, it was certainly not the way that we wanted to prove our editorial model. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of things that we had been covering 
um, prior to this latest invasion uh, proved to be extremely relevant to understanding what's happening in Ukraine today. And these are things like um, rewriting of history and man manipulation of historical narratives, Putin's obsession with the Second World War. Um, the, you know, we've done a lot of features on this phenomena of what Putin calls denazification. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, they, uh, we had reported on um, an old now Russian uh, myth that came to surface with this invasion, which was the existence of biolabs, US-funded biolabs across, um, across the region. It was definitely one of the you know, big things that Russia accused Ukraine of when the war for, and partially how they justified the invasion. They, they, they yeah. found few excuses, but we had been uh, covering that. So it's, um, and once again, now we're also trying to, we have the luxury um, of not, um, having to cover day-to-day -day news um, and instead look at trends and patterns yeah. that are shaping this conflict. More in-depth in investigations. That's right. And also sort of the underlying, the underlying yeah. trends that are shaping it. All right. Beautiful. Uh, Dasha Slavjanka. I did it correctly, right? Uh, you're a Belarusian activist, also a former journalist, I uh, uh, was told. And um, you're living in the Netherlands now. Uh, for quite a while, uh, but you still follow uh, all the news uh, daily um, from Belarus, from Ukraine. Um, what are your main sources where you get your news from, and do you see a difference in, in, in narrative in the Dutch media and to opposed to the sources you are following? <clears throat> yes, indeed, for me it's very important to understand what's going on, and even though I live here for a while, before I used to go back and forward all the time, so I always uh, thought I live like two countries mm -hmm. and I always felt what's going on. I never felt that I live abroad until 2020. Uh, so now I, I read uh, different sources, but after 2020, Telegram channels became mm -hmm. uh, extremely popular. What also happening now in other countries, kind of this model of Telegram channels, especially when uh, media are censored, uh, are moving, is moving. So my main uh, source is, uh, I, I try to, <laughs> to read everything because now it's almost impossible to, to follow all the news. But we have some Belarusian news that were uh, forced to leave the country, but mm -hmm. they still have quite a good coverage. I also need to check some propaganda uh, official sources just to understand what is uh, the narrative and look for hidden um, signs. And of course, I try to follow uh, Dutch news because mm -hmm. uh, there are also my uh, fellow Belarusians who try to bring uh, Belarus and keep Belarus on agenda. And of course, I see how differently things are covered sometimes. And uh, I think we're going to discuss it also, yeah. like seeing uh, Belarus through Russian um, lenses, not only Belarus, but a region in general. That so the Dutch media looks towards Belarus and the region through a Russian lens? Uh, before, say. definitely, yes. Okay. Uh, but I think in 2020, also also situation changed. We kind of uh, received uh, um, our independence, uh, media independence, and we are seen as a separate country now. But sometimes you still have to uh, remind that we are different. Than Russia. Yes, yeah. and that's kind of things we work yeah. for as well. And then our last guest is uh, Franka Hummels, also a freelance journalist uh, specialized in, in Belarus. Mm -hmm. uh, and you work for Radio 1 and various other news yeah. outlets. And when you just graduated, you made a documentary on the youth oh, movement. Before I graduated. Oh, was it before? Yes. Oh, then my yeah. information I didn't look it up correctly. Yeah. But it was about the youth movement and opposition in Belarus. Uh, t uh, we t took two um, oppositional youth movements yeah. and also one governmental. Yeah. Uh, and we tried to show them to the yeah, end the movie that we made a documentary movie, Nyeta Mazi. Yeah. Don't be slow. Don't be slow. And you wrote a book, The Generator, Generator Generatie, Generator Generation. Yeah, about people who were children when Chernobyl disaster happened. And in Belarus, that's still, uh, even when the book appeared in 2011, um, it was it was and is a propaganda dictatorship, so you don't have any information about what actually happened and how it still impacts you. So how do you make choices if you know you cannot trust the government, or if you don't know you cannot trust the government? Yeah. So it's it's more like about society as well. Yeah. Like how do you live? 
with such a disaster. Yeah. <clears throat> and did you see since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine like a, a surge in interest also in Belarus? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, because well, Ukraine is attacked from Belarusian soil as well. Um, and it's then we've already in the previous program we already spoke about it, but that we have to distinguish between Belarus as a country, Belarusian soil, Belarusian regime, and Belarusian people. Yeah. Um, because Belarusian people hugely oppose this war, but the regime, well, facilitates it, is yeah. definitely 100% complicit. Yeah. So that's. Um, so there, yes, there is a lot of uh, extra interest for Belarus at the moment as well in okay. Dutch media. All right. Uh, well, let's start with a round table discussion. And I would like to invite you just to also react on each other uh, when you hear something you don't agree with or really agree with. Uh, Natalia, first real question for you. Um, here in the West, people seem shocked by the sudden invasion. Uh, you're from Georgia. Uh, you had a similar experience in 2008. Uh, in Georgia, did people were also shocked? Was it also sudden or did, was it seen coming from Georgia perspective? I think there was an element of shock just because of the sheer, sheer scale of this latest invasion. Um, I think a lot of people around me did not expect that to happen. I mean, I got it wrong. I said it wouldn't happen. Um, it wouldn't ha I, I was expecting an offensive on the Donbass, but I was not expecting the bombardment of Kiev. So um, there was an element of surprise and shock um, <clears throat> from the audacity of what Putin did. But at the same time, you know, it very much felt like well, we had all been to the dress rehearsal of mm -hmm. this, and not just in Georgia, and not just in 2008. I mean, we go back to the wars of the 1990s, where similar models were used by Russia. You know, these are Chechnya. three Putin years, Abkhazia, Chechnya, South yeah. Ossetia, Transnistria, you know, all those frozen conflicts, frozen now conflicts that um, Russia uses, Russia created and has used to manipulate the governments um, and manipulate the, the, the countries that came out, were born out of the Soviet collapse. Um, uh, but, you know, beyond the region as well, I mean, Syria is an example. Yeah. That was a dress rehearsal for what, are we, what are we're seeing happening in, yeah. in Ukraine as well. Um, so, yes, I think it was met... Um, Definitely, with a lot of frustration, um, you know that it was it was r refreshing almost to see what felt at the time like the awakening of the West, um, especially in Europe. You know, sudden realization that oh yes, you know this this is serious and this is close to us. Um, but you know, to me, it was extremely frustrating as well because you know, having covered MH17, having covered um, the war in the Donbass uh, in the 2014, 2015, you know, you just kept and having covered and lived through Georgia. And before that, you know, as a, as a child sort of growing yeah. up in Georgia as well, um, you know, you kind of thought, well, it did not have to come to this. This was actually preventable. Yeah. And in Georgia, is there now a uh, fear for further Russian expansion into Georgia or other countries in the region? Um, there is there is a lot of anxiety. There is no question. Um, there is a lot um, of fear that, you know, depending on what happens in Ukraine, and I think, you know, things are good, looking good militarily. I mean, it was, it's been such a disaster for Russia. So, but if Putin's regime survives, and I think there's still chances are very high that it will survive because the military defeat does not necessarily mean the end of the regime, and we haven't got the military defeat yet either. Um, so, if if Putin, uh, you know, if if the regime survives, um, with especially with the public sentiment in Russia as it is. Um, it's uh, Georgia and Moldova that are the low-hanging fruit in yeah. terms of Russian, the Kremlin's, you yeah. know, ability to kind of reinstate itself. Um, I'm not expecting tanks to roll in. I mean, 
hopefully not famous last words uh, <laughs> tomorrow. But um, you know, Georgia, the important thing to uh, to remember, and you know, there's so many sort of bits of the narratives that are missing from the Western telling of the story. You know, Georgia, Georgia is already occupied. Uh, yeah. You know, and this is a, not a new war. I mean, it's a continuation of the war that. Um, started in 2008, then we saw Crimea, then we saw the Donbass, now, yeah, yeah. now we're seeing this. And you manage the public opinion in Russia, is it very much in favor of the war? or? You know, it's so difficult to measure the public opinion in Russia. Obviously, the polls that we're seeing that are largely kind of seem to be approving of the war, um, they cannot totally be trusted either. Um, but what we know is that, no, people are not coming out en masse to say this is not acceptable. And I am talking to quite a few Russians who mm -hmm. are saying, well, you know, it's terrible for both sides. And you think, well, no, it's not terrible. For, like, yes, it's terrible for the Russian society and Russian history and where that country is going to head next and what kind of future it will have. But this war, you know, it's, it's like this is a pre pretty black and white picture here. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, it has become increasingly difficult to talk to Russians who uh, are in Russia and who oppose it, who are very uh, afraid. Um, and I think the overwhelming majority is basically complacent. Yeah, I saw you nodding, uh, Dasha. Uh, do you have something to add to this? Well, of course, many things resonate and uh, there are also things we just discussed uh, during uh, coffee with the colleagues and uh, <clears throat> talking about... Uh, the feeling about the war, actually, I was the one who was pessimistic about Russia, mm -hmm. which was seen, uh, I, 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 some people called me like, you are Russia phobic or something like, you know, anti-Russia. But uh, I, I was the one who was always telling, look what they're doing to Georgia, and no one was like, really, uh, no one cared. And uh, I personally, I knew the, the war will happen, I just imagined it differently. I, saw, I thought there will be a different role for my country. But that's what you told about fruits. Actually, for Russia, we have fruit on the on the ground, on the floor. Yeah. So that actually, strategically, <laughs> I thought they will just pick up and move. Yeah. But they decided, okay, we will go go for the most difficult one, and then it will be easy uh, to pick up demoralized. Yeah. So for me personally, it was like almost crying now the feeling that our country became a co-aggressor. Yeah. Uh, because I was always thinking about, oh, poor Russians, I mean, normal <laughs> Russians, yeah, yeah. you know, like being from a, a country that is aggressor. Even when I was in Georgia, I was always telling, I'm from Belarus. <laughs> because, you know, everyone loved Belarus. So I kind of used to the role of a victim, yeah. but I, w I was never preparing myself for the country of being a, yes, co-aggressor. Yeah. Uh, thanks God we have something to... Uh, we can rely on on our experience of 2020 to prove that uh, the society is against uh, the yeah. war and we cannot put the equality sign uh, between the regime and the society. But uh, yeah, the picture is quite pessimistic. Yeah. And uh, we should also understand that it's not only Putin, it's a part of society and it's also a huge, huge network of a KGB, uh, face by stuff of these agents that really inherit methods yeah. through generations and this network is hidden, it's in every country and uh, yeah, so we, I kind of saw the pattern but unfortunately it, I agree it, the war was completely preventable but uh, the West, the world just felt very uncomfortable confronting Russia uh, government and Russian society still yeah. is actually yeah. yeah. I want to add, I, um, not from a professional perspective, but from a personal perspective, my partner is Syrian and his parents just left Syria to Turkey. Um, and we came back from Turkey to see them the day or that the war started actually. And those weeks with my parents-in-law, it was really like, mm when the war will start. Yeah. <laughs> there was no surprise for that. And you still see it, for example, here, when military experts compare, for example, what they're trying to do to Mariupol, uh, to um, Aleppo, then they will say, yeah, yeah it's yeah, the yeah. same what Assad was doing in Aleppo. And like, no, it's not what Assad was doing in it Aleppo. It was the Russians. It was Putin as well. But yeah. people just don't realize they because they've been overlooking that. that. So uh, we have not... Um, Ad been addressing yeah. um, correctly who is doing what, where. I mean, people here, they know that Aleppo is horrible, uh, of course, but they were not that much aware 
what happened and who did that. Yeah, they even appointed the same military yes. general, right? That mm -hmm. uh, destroyed Aleppo. Yeah, so, but that's, a lot of people are not that much aware of those kind of things, I yeah. think. So let's move to another part of the region, Flores. Uh, September last year, you were in Armenia. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, how, how are, do, do the Armenians look towards the Russians? Are they afraid of the Russians? or They are not happy with the Russians. Um, but I've the Russians are present in Yes, Armenia. I visited Armenia last year in September. The, the year before there was the war with Nagorno about Nagorno-Karabakh against uh, Azerbaijan. Yeah. And um, you see, Armenia is totally depending dependent from uh, Russia. It has no friends around uh, the country. Georgia maybe, but Georgia is too small to to, to have great influence and to help uh, Armenia. So Armenians only uh, can only watch, can only see to Russia and asking for help. So during this war uh, with Azer against Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan got help from Turkey. Um, and Russia. Uh, and Russia, yes. <laughs> the, the, the Armenians felt left alone. Yeah. So somehow in, during this war they had to Back, uh, Russia, please yeah. come help us. And Russia knew that uh, Armenia was that kind of uh, uh, the weakest part of Armenia. So, at the end, Russia managed to say, "Okay, yes, we can help you, but we have to. Well, then we have to. Uh, uh, then we, we will send some peacekeepers to the border uh, with Armenia and yeah. Azerbaijan." So, at the end, you see now uh, that uh, Russian troops are into Armenia. The FSB, the uh, security. Uh, services in Armenia uh, around the border. And the Armenians know that defense and security is now in the hands and the control of, uh, of Russia. So without making a war like in Georgia or Ukraine, uh, they now also control uh, Armenia. So also in this way you see this imperial ambitions of Putin yeah. into this Armenia. Some pictures, I think these are yours, yeah. right? This is uh, uh, forever together. It's a sign when you uh, drive into Sunik, that's a province uh, within Armenia connecting with Azerbaijan and as soon as you ride into this province, this region, you see, it's, uh, uh, you notice uh, Russian soldiers, Russian military vehicles. So this is the, the way that uh, Armenia is locked up or connected now to Russia. So they are not, all, they are, they, they are not happy with Russia at all. Uh, but this war, they have also this feeling this, during this war uh, with Ukraine, of, uh, between Ukraine or uh, that's opened uh, Russia, uh, this invasion into Ukraine. The Armenians are also saying, where was the West when we needed them? Yeah. So this kind of mixed feelings are also around in, uh, in Armenia. Yeah, but how, yeah, how could the West help Armenia? Yeah, that's a difficult situation because Armenia is, is locked up into this, uh, we are far, from way, far away from it, from uh, the European Union, United States, France. Um, so that's difficult. Now you, uh, Armenia is trying to have better relationships with Turkey, for example, because they know if you are too dependent from uh, Russia, we will get into trouble, and we have to uh, uh, spread our chances, to put it that way. So, but on the other hand, you see also uh, the political stance of Armenia is they are kind of neutral. They are not voting against uh, or for uh, Russia in, into, in the United Nations uh, mm -hmm. Security Council, all kinds of, of, of uh, decisions they want to make. Um, also, not into, uh, they are not involved into sanctions against Russia, so they, are, they know they're independent from uh, Russia, so they cannot push back Russia at all from their... Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's, uh, it's a very different... It's a kind of a very different scenario in Armenia, and I, I hear that from a lot of Armenian mm -hmm. friends in terms of not even where was the West, but like why didn't the world pay, atten pay attention when yep. you know we were at war just recently? Um, but I think what's the most striking, you know, Russia has always been a lifeline for a country that's landlocked, that's surrounded by pretty much surrounded by enemies, um, Azerbaijan, Turkey. Um, but the extraordinary thing about the Nagorno-Karabakh war, the recent Nagorno-Karabakh war, was that Russia has a massive military base um, in Gumri, in Armenia. I mean, a huge, huge military presence. And yet they sat back and they watched Azerbaijan take Armenian territories and they did nothing. Yeah. They watched so until it, the moment that that's right. Armenia, yeah. please help us. Yeah. So it was it really threw the country into this existential crisis where they realized that the only their only lifeline, yeah. Yeah, the only, only way out is, actually, is, is Russia. Yeah. yeah, and Russia knows it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And is this a pattern uh, throughout the region, like uh, maybe the Baltics and the, what is the, yeah, how, how how are they related to 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 Russia? Yeah. 
how the Baltics are really. Now, the, like, throughout the region, is it a pattern that, that the people are really like of, afraid of, of the Russian influence, or are there also re parts of the region that are more independent and stronger uh, against the uh, Russian presence. Yeah, I think uh, look, I think everyone in the region is feeling extremely jittery about the fact that I mean, look at what's happening in Ukraine. This yeah. is like close to everyone, and I think there is a full embrace of the fact that you know, f like in Georgia, people just feel Ukraine is Georgian war, and in the Baltic, I think uh, people feel the same. Um, uh, but I think what we've also seen is you know the 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 Baltics are much closer to that resurgence of um, hope that you know, of the others, sort of the, the the war made a lot of things much clearer as well. Um, and um, I think, you know, what Dasha was saying, you know, Belarus, they've got it, Georgia, Russia basically doesn't even need to invade, they can just walk in. Armenia, they have, and given the military performance of the Russians, you know, these are the countries that Russia is likely to go for rather than the Baltics, because yeah. the Baltics, with, with all the NATO activity right on the border, I think, mm -hmm. in some ways, the Bal and with, you know, the Scandinavians, uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO, you know, they, that, that part of, uh, of the region is really sort of changing um, and going much more, uh, you know, securely westward. Um, so uh, has it united uh, the countries, post-Soviet countries, or is it like in uh, together we fight against the stronger brother? Yeah, Do you think it has? Yeah, because I wanted <coughs> actually uh, to, to to add something on this topic, uh, because there 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 was and still is. Let's call it geopolitical victim blaming, and it started with Georgia when, uh, with the help of Russian propaganda. Uh, Georgia was actually accused in the war. Uh, so there is a, a thought that uh, it's Saakashvili who provoked Russia. Uh, Georgians started first, and even this badly written uh, EU report. And uh, it was very uh, comfortable for the West to at least put a, a part of the guilt on Georgia and continue business as usual. Yeah. And then Ukraine, uh, Crimea happened, almost the same scenario, a lot of uh, same things, but it still was kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe there are fascists in Ukraine. I, I, I heard a lot of such um, uh, things in the West. But um, what is important to see here, that all these countries behaved <clears throat> differently with Russia, but none of us, let's say, survived. Lukashenko, yeah, the is the same. Yes, Lukashenko was really like uh, playing a, a stupid uh, small brother, always like, a, you know, to, to Russia, like uh, very naive, stupid people give us money. Didn't help, like, you know, like we were selling, like not we, he was selling this kind of love. Uh, Armenia, when uh, the revolution happened, and um, they, they tried their best to stress it's not a geopolitical revolution. We are fed up. With corruption was there, just enormous, incredible corruption. People really couldn't live anymore. So that was really not a geopolitical revolution. And um, Pashinyan, the president, before he was quite pro-European, pro but when he went to power, he, he, he made the, his best to keep low profile, you know, like, and be kind of friends with Russia. Even Saakashvili, if I'm not mistaken, when he just came to power, he tried to build some relations yeah, the, with, with the Russia. First, the first, his first foreign trip was yeah, to Russia. Yeah, he Moscow. invited a lot of, uh, and that was the greatest mistake, I invite some oligarchs from Russia. Yeah. Uh, so, like... People tried their best, and then, okay, Georgians cho chose completely different roads than Belarus, and they really fight openly and bravely, and we see now they're just miserable what, what Russia made to them, because, as I told, it's a network, and they really revenge when their people are removed. They had their people in Georgia, in Ukraine, and in Armenia, in Moldova, and if you take their guys out, doesn't matter how you try, they will come and revenge for this. So that's um, that's important thing to understand that there is no one to blame. You cannot blame the country. You cannot blame NATO. Yeah. It was a Russian plan. 
there, are, there, there is a pattern how... Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you can <laughs> no, always you can find more to blame. <laughs> no, I would, I would put them, let's say, responsibility. A lot of things would have worked out differently. No, but, I mean, no, I mean, you know, people kind of blame NATO for spreading, you know? Mm. But, for expansion. Uh, yeah, for expansion. Yeah. Uh, but I would put, more, let's say, responsibility on the West because definitely it was um, preventable, it was possible to press on Russia, it was possible to put borders in relations. But as you see, wherever you choose as a strategy you receive the war in a certain, uh, in this or that way, it's still. Yeah, yeah. whether you stuck up to them or you fight them, you the know, you still get the same result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and on the other hand, it's still important that here in Western Europe that we, um, okay, we see that some countries deal with the same kind of problems, like the connection between Georgia and Ukraine in this case is very clear, but we should not think that this, what you often hear also here in the Netherlands, like those kind of countries. Yeah. I mean, yes, they were all part of Soviet Union, but yeah. I use this metaphor that if my pocket is picked by some pickpocket and yours too, it doesn't make us siblings. No. So, I mean, it's post-colonial thing yeah. as well. And Ukraine and Georgia are not the same, Belarus and Georgia. So it's really important for us here in Western Europe to look precisely. And yes, we should see the similar similarities in problems, but we should also see the differences yeah. and be aware of that continuously. And is that uh, um, that we we have not been aware of that? Is that also to blame maybe on 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 the you already said it the Russian lens the media our media hand? I think it's it's, it's a big difference. What I, if we in the West we see Russia as, as different than Georgians and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Belarusians etc. Because we don't know they this is their neighbor. Russia. Yeah. They know what Russia is capable of. They know what Russia's plans are. We, as, as the West, we have NATO. We think we are safe. So in that perspective, we cannot imagine so far until mm. this war what is, what is to be to be a neighbor of Russia. We don't know what kind of power such big country is, is around us. Yeah, but it's, it's also so misguided, right? Because we have seen plenty of evidence of how powerful Russia is and mm -hmm. pushing its narratives through very local um, channels that exist in different countries, you know, whether it's, you know, Italy, the far right groups, mm -hmm. the, the, the far left groups yeah. in the West and so on. So you don't actually have to be the neighbor of Russia in order to... Uh, experience its destabilizing influence. Uh, there is plenty of it, you know, yeah, uh, far away too. So far, yet so close. It's, it's yeah. exactly the title. For us, it's so far. And until this war, it's becoming close. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's right. the difference between but why living is there, with yeah. We had the luxury that we could ignore this evidence. Yeah. Uh, except, you know, arguably, you know, if you consider M17 yes. yes. to be of Holland's 9-11, yes. yes. you know, this, no, no, no. this, this it, has happened. It we has are going cost, to pay for Russian it. Russian missiles yes. have cost Dutch lives. Yes. So. We and still, gas. and still, yeah. But why is there so, because you're, what you're telling us, there were so many examples already, so many stories of how you could see that how Russia is destabilizing the region and uh, international order. Why did we in the West have so little interest in it? Is that uh, a role of the media or, or is it political? Or? Uh, because we, we were always thinking about this Russian perspective through this Russian lens. If we want to have business with Ukraine, uh, or some kind of negotiation, we're always thinking, what will Putin do? What mm -hmm. will Russia say? So we have to get rid of this kind of, of thinking yeah. and just take Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltics, uh, or Georgia as an independent country. That's, I think, the biggest mistake we made in the last, since 1991. And yeah. I, I guess language, in a way, is also a handicap in that sense, because uh, it's really nice if journalists speak the language, and the language they would speak is Russian. They would work from Moscow. And of course, you can work with Russian in Belarus or Ukraine. But it gives you a Moscow perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, I mean, for example, Flores is a good example of someone who has always been aware of that. But a lot of correspondents are not that much aware. They think from this post-Soviet perspective, perspective. Yeah. Um, and they use Russian without hesitation, for example, even in Georgia. Um, which is not a good idea. And um, so that's, I think, in this way, the language, knowing the language, which I really think is important, is also a handicap. Yeah. And also is a handicap to our information in the West. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's cultural as well, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, how much of the Western world relates to 
you know, Caucasus is a very obscure place for most mm-hmm. people in the West, fair enough, but the way they relate to the Caucasus is, say, you know, through Lermontov's writing, mm-hmm. right? So that Russian prism is, for reasons that are understandable and justifiable, are extremely um, are strong. Um, you know, people historically have seen, have, have looked at that part of the world through the eyes, um, through the eyes of Russia. That's how people have related to it. And and, and media certainly hasn't done a very good job um, in um, in explaining and showing the nuance and complexity of that worldview, because yeah. media in general is not very good at showing nuance and complexity. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, when the war when when the war started in February, you know, it was really striking how across the mainstream media this was, you know the invasion, the war has broken out, and you think, well, no, that has been going on for eight years. You know, there was absolutely no kind of, hind- uh, there was no sort of c- uh, awareness of c- continuity of yeah. the, uh, the war. The war the started actually in 2014 when they invaded right. the Donbass. Yeah. yeah. And how, because um, you said the, the, the media is not good at, at showing complexity, um, but how can we make people in the West, how can the media uh, make clear to us in the West that the stories are relevant for us and are about our future also, the stories that happen in Georgia and, 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 and Belarus, and cause how can we approach that in a, in a good way? Um, I, I, you know, I don't think we, you know, we necessarily need to reinvent the the wheel um, to be able to do that. I think all the tools are there. Um, obviously, you know, attention deficit in general doesn't help. And um, I'm amazed, actually, by how this war has managed to hold attention. I mean, it has waned compared to February, but it's still very much, you know, in the headlines. But, you know, if you think about it, who remembers Afghanistan? That Mm -hmm. just happened, uh, you know, and it's a disaster at the moment. Um, And that is going to come back and, uh, you know, um, haunt us too. So it's about... um, kind of trying to um, commit to stories, I guess, not just as individual journalists, because I think there are lots and lots of journalists who are very committed to certain stories and they keep going back and they keep following and so on. But as as the industry, as newsrooms, um, but that's much harder because that's not what the industry is built around. No. This is one of the biggest fears right now in, in Ukraine that the attention will get less uh, in the upcoming months because they know if the attention will get less, there will less support, humanitarian help will, le- will become less, uh, webs become less, uh, money will become less. So that's, that's the thing they are uh, very uh, frightened of. I was last March, I was in, in Kiev, and I never, uh, they were so happy to see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they want, to tell their show, they, they want to tell their story, because they know, uh, we have to, to know, we have to let the world know what's going to happen over here, what's happening over here. So uh, they are very, uh, trying to keep uh, uh, Ukraine still on the agenda. Yeah. And how's that in, in, in Belarus? <clears throat> Before moving to Belarus, yeah. I wanted to add also something to the previous topic of why in the West uh, some things were missed. I remember I was here on one uh, discussion, I think Khodorkovsky was here, and there was some Russian, for me, <laughs> so obviously aggressive propaganda woman, like, I was like, okay, so I, I, you can see them on Russian TV, like, regularly, every day. And then I told, like, my friend, Dutch friend, oh, my God, what she is doing here in this country? She works for the embassy or what? And he's like, no, it's alternative opinion. We cannot shut up these people. We should listen. And that's, you know, and then I realized that what is obvious for me, she is not alternative opinion. She is a weapon. Yeah. And um, I propaganda was myself too. so many times on the uh, seminars of the Western uh, human rights defenders, politicians, journalists for, let's say, our countries always come in to teach, but they never wanted to learn. And our countries can teach a lot about uh, propaganda, hybrid uh, war and stuff like this. So mm-hmm. that was one of the mistakes, that um, it was only, only one uh, way, kind of thinking if we have prosperity, democracy, yeah. uh, we know better. But the difference is that this society inherited this mostly, and we are building, so we are in the process, and we lived in different political uh, situations. We still kind of lived in Soviet Union, Perestroika, now, so we have kind of a broader scope and understanding 
for example, uh, okay, that's a different example, but for election observation, you know, CEO Deer, uh, there are a lot of people from Balkans there, actually. And I think it's because they understand how all this fraud, blah, 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 work. So for them, it's very easy to do this job because they see how the schemes work. Yeah, so they have this experience. So I think that was the big problem, that uh, the experience was not taken seriously. Then uh, Russia uh, strategy is very spread in time. So like Russia is cooking societies very slowly, including their own society. Mm -hmm. There are so many events that are going, like let's say like in 20 years, and if you have your life, you just forget them. But if you look through them, it's a puzzle. And then, of course, if you're a journalist, you follow it. You know, you remember, you see the picture. But in here, in the West, politicians change. And everyone comes without this knowledge. But we live in this um, situation nonstop. So we have this continuation in our um, head. That's why for us it was easier to see. to see. And the third thing what Russia is doing to our region, let's say, not allowing us to be friends between us. So all the relations we have are through Russia as well. So there are no direct close connection, even between Belarus and Ukraine, the closest ones. So now we realize Ukrainians know nothing about us. So that was how Russia was keeping us um, apart, keeping us in conflict. There are some issues between Georgia and Armenia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So that's how they wanted us to be um, fragmented. And um, that, that the, the problem also why it happened. And what was about the words? <laughs> uh, I was, I was uh, wondering, because we were talking about uh, what, what Flo said, um, the, the Ukrainians are very happy to, to that journalists are coming because the attention ah, is yes. still going on. Uh, but uh, how, because uh, Belarus, the, the, the elections were like two years or one year ago. There was a lot of uh, uh, social uh, upheaval, uh, a lot of interest. But now... <clears throat> Uh, it seems to have, but well, you don't hear anything about Belarus now in 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 the West. So, how can we? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we still do in a way that uh, uh, that that's a very uh, good question. We, as a journalist or journalist-related people, have to address ourselves and to our societies. How comes uh, when we have very good news coverage? people's memory and actually journalist memory is so extremely short because I think uh, from 2020 also with the help of Franca, Floris, as a journalist, I think Belarus was extensively covered more than ever in media and we were like, oh, this uh, courageous people, everyone understood, Tsikhanovsk, uh, everyone knows. So I was like, okay, now everyone knows Belarus, everyone understands the war starts, and then you see Belarus uh, attacks Ukraine, so uh, Lukashenko is the president. It's kind of these two years of work was just disappeared. Yeah. And then apparently uh, everyone forgot that we have uh, thousands of political prisoners, uh, even in countries like Poland that are next to us. So there was some aggression towards Belarusians, and we have now to work even harder, because for us it's also a lot of pain for Ukraine, so a lot of us work now as volunteers uh, for Ukraine. But now we have to kind of prove uh, ourselves, but I, I really uh, see that people consume news like fast food, it's digested, bye-bye, <laughs> I don't know, and then they don't remember. And uh, so, yeah, for us, it's a very difficult thing now to put Belarus uh, back uh, on the agenda, not only as a co-aggressor in this war, but also to keep talking about pol people are still in prisons. So, uh, like last year, we were talking about them, and this year, I don't know, no one cares, because, of course, if you compare it to what they do in Ukraine, I mean, actually, nothing matters if you compare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's also psychologically very uh, difficult to, let's say, sell your topic uh, yeah. and compete with a war topic. Yeah. Frank, do you see that? Uh, no, you can go well, first. If I, um, I see that, uh, for now, the media and also the audience, seeing that there's a Belarusian population and Lukashenko, it's, they see and it's covered, right, that the people of we Belarus are... Because there is an effort. There yes. is a Tsikhanovka. If you also the, the, the railways, for example, is a good example that they But this is lobby. This is lobby from diaspora. This is also lobby from those journalists who work with us for a long time and they know the topic. And mm -hmm. also lobby from our uh, political democratic uh, forces. If you, if you would not do this, it's very easy and convenient just to report on Belarus as a mm -hmm. partner in crime. 
Yeah, Fra but I, I, I mean, I'd like I to jump one, in. One, one question yeah, to Franka. Mm -hmm. No, just uh, you jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's better. I want to jump in with a quick defense of people who do not follow the news. You know, yeah. I think it's a lot to ask a Dutch, French, a German who has a full-time job, oh, yeah, and kids to feed, is. and uh, <coughs> gas bills to pay to come for home and mm. sort of figure out what's happening in Armenia or what's happening in um, uh, Belarus or anywhere or, or Sri Lanka. Um, but I think what the Ukraine war has shown, uh, and I think what needs to be changed in the public understanding of uh, you know, how things are interlinked and how they work is the erosion of democracy in faraway places has direct effect, makes the world a less safe place overall. So, and that's why, you know, we should care. And you don't need to know the intricacies of local politics in every country. I mean, it's impossible to do that. Um, but I think the, in terms of electing officials, you know, in, in places where people have the luxury of voting for their politicians. You know, we need to be voting in politicians who understand why democracy matters in countries that are even far away mm. from yours. If, if, if Russia will win in Ukraine, that, that would be a big signal to Armenia, to Georgia, to Belarus, because it will give Russia confidence to... To conquer the other countries. Whatever they want to do. Or and that means conquer that, us or... Yeah. But, also the Netherlands and yeah, Italy yeah. and Germany. It's, yeah, but yeah. the low fruit and the big fruit. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. No, and there's, uh, there's um, uh, Dasha already said something about this um, Dutch or Western European arrogance about, for example, teaching courses like explaining how journalism works or something mm -hmm. like that. And there's another mechanic um, in Dutch media that I see at least towards Belarus and I see it towards other countries too. I don't see it for Ukraine, which I think is some kind of a win. Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, like I'm, uh, well, I'm a Belarus expert and then people ask me, what do people in Belarus feel? Okay, that makes sense because I speak Dutch. I speak to people in Belarus. But um, for example, people from Belarus, like Dasha, is also a Belarus expert. And it happens quite often that there's a Belarusian guest, and then me to say that what they have been saying is correct. Yeah. And this comes from an idea that those people from a non-democratic country, they don't know how it works, they don't know how to properly explain things. It's like a little bit of looking down, it's a bit yeah. of arrogance. And with this way of looking at people, which is totally untrue, of course, I mean, it's... <laughs> well, I don't have to explain no. that. But we also, it also feels like a lost cause because if those people are not smart enough to have democracy, why would you help them yeah. fight for democracy? And we've been working. Marina, she's, I just saw, yeah. She, she's Belarusian and she speaks Dutch and she has been doing a lot of media in 2020 and Ilya as well. But, um, and that's, I always also tried, for example, with media that I work with, if they ask me to try to divert it and not do this yeah. for myself, to just also sh like see those smart and nice Belarusians who speak Dutch and have them tell the story. We actually had it in Bali because in the night of dictatorship, yeah. they asked me to talk about Belarusian activists and it yeah. was going to be in English. So I was like, no, speak to Belarusian activists. Yeah. Um, and this is something I think it happens for a lot of countries, but I think it's also a handicap. It's, I, I also think it's going to, it's not putting value to the people from countries, I guess it works the same to a lot of other countries that in the Netherlands we look down on, I guess in Africa you would see the same kind of the dynamics, yeah. but for Belarus or other countries you would see it, yeah. So yeah. that's, it's, it's, I really think that it's something that media should be aware of. Yeah, and it's the kind of a, of a blind spot that we have for, for these, what you just mean. Yeah, saying. the qualities of the people, yeah. then they know, I mean, of course. Yeah, and what, what political impact do you think that it had? Uh, is that made it for Putin easier to just go ahead and do his thing? Because we, we just don't speak to the people from the countries themselves. Yeah, well, we also made it Putin quite easy because we don't want to lose the trade. Yeah. Um, also so it's, and also because there is some kind of scare because like Lukashenko is not an enemy to the Netherlands. I mean, he's not a threat. Putin is, maybe. So, yeah, it's not just, it's just like, oh, he's, maybe he's not so nice, maybe he's... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Natalia, with Koda... We always, we always thought that, especially for German, Germany, that we, through 
uh, trade we th thought we can uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. make yeah. Russia a friend, make to build up some democracy or good ties with Russia. But yeah, well that, that, that yeah but I mean, that's the thing about the whole Putin uh, narrative. You know, it, it, I mean, the man has been pretty honest about mm. what he's up to. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just no one listened. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's told us what he was going to do. Already, and he's yeah. been at war with the West for the last decade, um, openly, quite openly. You know, you watch Russian television, you think, oh, A, the Second World War finished yesterday and we're still celebrating, and B, the Nazi you know, threat still looms, and America is about to bomb Russia, and they're the biggest enemy, and Europe is helping them. That's the narrative that Russians have heard and, for the past and, and why years. does that narrative does not, does not reach Europe? Is that through disinformation? I mean, I or? think it's more of a, I think it's more of a question for, for the Europeans than yeah, for yeah. me, but I think... Uh, and the answer is complicated, and economy, and complacent and wishful thinking, certainly, as you say, that plays into it, no, no, um, no question. Um, and then I think there's just general, uh, you know, sense that, you know, the West has sorted things out, and they tend to look at everyone else as, you know, countries, you know, kind of opposite of what you're saying, but also countries that it's, it's, it's a fair game. So, um, you know, for Putin, for example, everything that has to do with information is the information war. Like, this gathering is information war for yeah. Putin, right? The West never looked at the Russian media in that way. The West never, and I'm not one for deplatforming or, you know, taking Russia Today off air, but, you know, there was no sense of Russia Today being, you know, it was treated as a proper media company that was doing its job, um, both in the United States for a long time and in Europe as well. Um, so that complacency played into it. And I think, yes, Russians have been very good at manipulating. And I think one of the greatest weapons that they have is this, you know, is what about tree. And they have managed to... Um, blur kind of narratives and facts by simply saying, well, what about, you know, and every time there was, you know, a question over, you know, Georgia, they would say, what, what about Iraq? And the thing is, they have a point. And I think one of the reasons that it worked is because the West, and I think in this case, especially the United States, has not also been very good at digesting, facing consequences, and processing um, things that the, the U.S. has done. It, so, yeah. Sorry, go, go on. No, like, you know, the ICC, the question of, you know, should Putin be uh, tried, and yeah. the, the war crimes question. Well, Putin is going to be saying... Well, what, what about, about Iraq? And what Bush, about Bush? Bush himself yeah. and, this is going to, and this is going to resonate yeah. with yeah. a lot of people in the West yes. for a good reason. And also so I think of the West. kind of but then it's also this uninformed thing because one of those memes that clearly came from Russia it actually said, "What about Syria?" Like, um, like this is like really the the word about trick uh, in total. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. Two, two things I would like to add is it's about this. It's, they're saying, what about Iraq? What about Yugoslavia? They are uh, former Yugoslavia, it's Libya. But you can turn it around. Well, you, had, you criticized that attacks, Western attacks, but now you're doing the same yeah. in Ukraine and Georgia. You, uh, yeah, but that, it doesn't work it, if you it turn does, it around. It work, because the, that puts you on a defensive. And of Putin course. has been, in, when it comes to information war, Putin has always been on the offensive. So whatever you do in return is actually you defending yourself against that argument. True, true. So it doesn't work. So where, uh, you know, the amazing thing with, with Ukraine uh, now, with this invasion, was that it was the first time that I saw the U.S. actually do it differently. And they went on the offensive. We sort mm -hmm. of you know, yeah. just putting it out in the open and saying that Russia will attack, Russia will attack, Russia will attack, and which turned out to be true. Um, and uh, you know, but it's it's not what Western democracies normally do. So I don't know whether it's a sign that no, I think the US has learned, from, learned or from the past, yes, yeah. uh, that, that it seems to be a sign that they've learned in the past, yeah. past. But the rest of it, it's very much kind of the it's very much on the on the defensive. And once you are on the defensive, you know you it's can't difficult. you can't win. It's a, the second thing I would like to add is you, you saw, see it also in discussions in Holland when you talk about this war. Immediately with certain people, they say America is doing the same. Yeah, uh, they just just focus the discussion on America, not 
talking about what Russia is doing. Yeah. So you see also here with people, not over here probably, <laughs> uh, in other kinds of, 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 of uh, circles, how do we say it? They are immediately focused on, yeah, but America, yeah, yeah. but America, yeah. yeah, but America. The funny thing, well, uh, I read like a few weeks ago, I don't know which page it was NRSA, that said um, uh, Putin is losing the information war over Ukraine. That's like a perspective we have in the West, like uh, the, the, the statements by Putin in Ukraine are constantly debunked and nobody believes them in the West. How is that in the non-Western countries, like Africa, Latin America. How is the war in Ukraine and everything seen in those kinds of parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I don't think Putin has totally lost the information war in the West. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if Donald Trump comes to power, yeah. <laughs> look at the conversation in the Republican Party, uh, look at Marine Le Pen. Uh, it, it, you know, there are a lot of people who voted for her. So, um, you know, the Russian ideologues go on Italian state, the public television. So I don't think the war is completely lost. And the war, what about tree being the most you know, potent weapon in terms of kind of saying, making people say, well, yes, they're doing it and it's horrible, but, you know, and that but really, um, and, you know, to me, what I always say to people is, well, yes, that's true, but you don't go to your, I don't know, friend's father's funeral and say, I'm really sorry, but, you know, my father died two years ago. Like, that's... Um, but the... Um, but one thing that we saw very clearly happen in... Um, uh, in the sort of uh, the immediate um, aftermath of the invasion, because we, you know there, there was definitely a moment when Putin lost a, a battle, not the war, uh, partially because he's been saying he wouldn't do it, he wouldn't do it, and then he did it, and he kind of made a bit of a fool of himself, and everything became you know black and white and pretty clear. Uh, but almost that? immediately when he invaded, having yeah. said that he wouldn't invade, when he invaded, you yeah. know, he and Ukrainians did an absolutely marvelous job with being sort of not not even giving him even a hint of any sort of provocation, right? He couldn't have, there was no, nothing to hang this yeah. on. Um, but what they did immediately is that they really uh, uh, realizing the Kremlin, I think, realized very clearly that Western Europe in first two, three weeks after the invasion, Western Europe and the U.S. were not worth kind of fighting in terms of the narratives. But they really focused on the non-Western world um, and the Russian disinformation campaigns in Africa, in Asia, India. Um, in the Middle East, um, you know, have really, um, up, they really kind of upped the ante and really went full on with messaging those parts of the world. Yeah. And of course, it matters. It matters for the UN. It matters for shaping public opinion generally. It gives them fodder to say to their domestic audiences, look, we might, you know, they hate us, but, you know, these people, these people don't. And then in March, sort of towards mid-March, we saw like very clear renewed attempts, uh, some of them quite successful, of propaganda pushes within Europe yeah. as well. And how's that in, in Belarus and Georgia? Is the disinformation campaign also influencing the public opinion there in yes. favor of uh, Russia? I don't know about Belarus. In Georgia, yes, definitely. In favor of Russia also? Uh, How is the public uh, opinion in, uh, in Georgia? It's You know, it's very... You know, the Russian disinformation doesn't need someone to favor Russia in order to work. Mm -hmm. It needs to sow doubt and make you not favor y Ukraine or the other or the West. Like that's all that's necessary, and that's quite easily achievable with the means that the Kremlin deploys. Yeah, and is that the same in Belarus? In Belarus, the situation is uh, a bit different uh, because we have propaganda uh, whole our life, like recent life, modern mm -hmm. uh, propaganda, let's say. What is interesting that people learn how to get information out of propaganda um, content. For example, political prisoners are tortured and, um, I mean, they're really tortured, but it's more like a, a torture. They have to watch TV uh, there, only state TV. And of course, there is a, a like harsh propaganda, but they actually understand what's going on in reality because they learned to read propaganda. And um, I see and compare two societies, Russian and Belarusian, how we see propaganda. 
we somehow manage not to be very poisoned by it. Uh, I cannot say that people really watch it. If you really, if you watch it, it's, it's really. Um, after 2020, Russia sent a lot of uh, journalists on uh, state TV in Belarus. Journalists. Jo uh, yeah, <laughs> the, they, they even pronounced the country name wrongly. So that's obvious that there are Russian people working there. So the, the level of our propaganda also changed, the style. But society the films became so much better on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so they much, much higher production standards. Yes. Yeah. So um, especially now, of course. Um, but you know, Russian propaganda it doesn't matter. It's not what you say, but how you say. Uh, how you say is mean that you shout on each other. Uh, you don't let your um, partner to speak at all, and any argument you can just uh, mirror, disagree. So it's. It's more like destroying the, not the even essence of the discussion, but just the, the way of discussion. And, um, in, but in Belarus, people uh, used to it. We know how to filter it. We mm -hmm. have alternative sources of information. Uh, people became uh, quite uh, technically savvy, so people know uh, how to find information. People are critical, and I think, of course, uh, we have this propaganda, but it's not so poisonous like it is in um, yeah. Russia. But to continue the topic, if uh, Putin lost or not here, I also don't think that completely, not, not um, we cannot say that he lost. There, there, is, there are some winnings, it's about NATO, because many people tend to see the reason in NATO expansion. No one, uh, it's again, uh, not giving us a sovereignty. Like many people think that NATO wants our countries. Mm -hmm. They don't think that actually Ukraine and Georgia want to NATO to prevent this yeah. war. They, be like, they, they knock the yeah. door as much as they can. It's not, uh, it's not open for them at all. But this narrative Russia is selling that if NATO would stop, it could be possible to prevent. Then this nuclear blackmailing also sold very well in the West. And um, uh, another narrative, I think maybe it's more for Germany, that there should be peace agreement between two parties, mm -hmm. kind of seeing that it depends on Ukraine as well, that Ukraine have to compromise when it's clearly, um, the situation is very Russia. clear, yeah. Ukraine has nothing to compromise, the Ukraine has to win, there is, cannot be compromise, Your, Ukraine should, should not compromise territories. But Russia sells this narrative as well, that maybe you just compromise some territories and sign peace agreement, what actually uh, the West forced Saakashvili, I think, right in this, also with the um, uh, role of France, what they do the same now yeah, right. again. So that was Sarkozy at that time. And um, yeah, so they, they still, and uh, buying, let's say, small parties or small media in the West, they don't need the smartest. They are okay with small, but they should be just the craziest and the loudest. Because the Russian propaganda works like secta. So they need, a, is it in English also? Sector? I think it's sector. Poli sect, political. <laughs> sector would be sect. Dutch, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, you need people yeah. who will be like fanatics. Uh, you don't need their logical thinking. But they, they just poison. So it doesn't matter. They just uh, make you doubt yourself. Yeah. To, like, I think that if you say that Ukraine won the information war, well, people, Ukraine became very goodly to the West. Like, people like Ukraine. But when it comes to actual actions or actually political thinking, I don't think it's really, I mean, still, there's still a lot of Russian narrative uh, going on. Right. And also, I mean, we have a politician who said that Putin was being mild and that he was a very nice guy and he did not, I mean, he did not win a lot at municipal elections, but he wasn't wiped out either. No. So, I mean, it's something you can actually say and not be politically punished very much to say that Putin is being mild. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's also here. It's also in our society. Yeah, and how do you look at, uh, for example, uh, a broadcaster as Ongehoord Nederland? Is that a... To, to give some uh, background, it's, um, we have a multi... Um, um, pure form <laughs> yeah. uh, media landscape so every group can form um, a, a broadcast organization and they can go on the public broadcast nets yeah. and this one it's um, right wing bordering idiots or maybe not even bordering <laughs> idiots um, which is maybe already an answer but it's really dangerous because they also have a lot of pro-Putin people yeah. on there but they 
fit in the system. They have enough members. They did everything right to have this time. Yeah. So if you would say they cannot be there, then you're actually fighting against your free media idea. So it's really, I don't know how to solve this puzzle in my head, but I know that they are dangerous. <laughs> but this is, this is maybe a way that puts in enters. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's no doubt about that. But you see this also in society when I speak, just what I said, I speak to people, they say, look, to America. So it's yeah, always already into here. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's also really important to uh, sort of be what, um, to accept that, I mean, Putin is not, you know, Russian approach to disinformation in general is also like throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. They just put a lot of stuff out there and they, you know, some things work and some things don't. And they're very good at, what they're very good at is like finding their target audiences and finding contagious, a subject of, um, that are controversial within the society, that there is a debate and then to taking over that debate. So that can be, you know, migration crisis was a really great mm -hmm. example where suddenly like Russia the Ukraine really, referendum in 2016. Yeah. Ukraine yeah. referendum yes. here yes. was a really good example. That's right. The migration crisis was another good example. And, uh, you know, they do it incredibly on very local level as well. Like in Georgia, it's LGBTQ, you know, that's the Russian agenda is almost entirely centered around, you know, people sort of making people think that it is being gay is anti-Georgian, anti-traditional, and we need to defend um, yeah. uh, sort of our traditional values. And that resonates. So they find these little, uh, little bits, little tidbits that are actually people can relate to and that are on people's minds. And they're not necessarily going to be talking to them about, you know, Ukraine or Belarus, because they know these things won't stick. But they throw out things that might stick that are relevant to people, yeah. um, and, and some of them too. Yeah. And again, the goal is really to sort of sort out. So it's not like, you know, Putin has lots of Euro local European politicians on speed dial. He doesn't need to. Oh. Um, he has the information. Yeah, and well, I remember the Dutch Christians being falling for this anti-gay uh, idea that Putin is protecting Christian values here. Like, that's right. That what? has been um, <laughs> the whole yeah. like traditional traditional yeah. values thing has been incredibly, um, incredibly potent kind of ground for Putin. It's been very fertile. It really paid off in the U.S. It paid off in Europe. Um, you know, the anti-abortion stuff, even though Russia is not, you know, there are no signs that Putin actually personally a homophobe. He's got loads of gay people in his cabinet. He likes uh, Abba, right? I didn't, I didn't know uh, what's that? He likes Abba, I heard. Yeah, yeah. That, right. I just know that. So, um, so it's not about personal. It's about, like, finding this, these things that he can get people arguing about and not agree on. And that's what they're really, really good at. Just to uh, maybe return a bit to the countries bordering Russia, Georgia, and uh, well, uh, it's funny. A lot of at the end, you're always talking about Putin. Yeah. <laughs> still, it happens. Still, still yeah. happens. Yeah. Always. Uh -huh. do, you, do you see, uh, maybe from a Georgian perspective and a Belarusian perspective, any chance to create like a solidarity between the countries and 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 yeah. Uh, That's my dream, actually. Geopolitically, I think it could be the ideal situation if after the collapse of Soviet Union yeah. there will be another alternative union like almost all the Soviet countries minus Russia and then it will be balanced like you have Russia then you have this uh, um, post-imperial countries uh, like another union and yeah. then EU and then uh, this uh, union would be very prosperous economically and politically very strong I think and there was such project actually it was called Baltic Chernovorsky Soyuz. It means Baltic Black Sea Union. There was such project, but of course, uh, like also Russia did everything to um, diminish it, and everyone was busy with own uh, problems and unsolved um, territorial and some historical issues between countries. We just didn't have time to solve them, yeah. talk, to discuss, to reconcile. To, we didn't have time to develop our identities. I think if we were not if we were not disturbed, we could come to this point in a, in a way. And uh, I also think it would be good for us because 
Uh, now Poland is getting stronger in uh, its position in the EU due to their role uh, in the war, how they mm -hmm. uh, help in the conflict, also Lithuania. But before they were still seen kind of not as the um, same as the West, Other, West yeah. countries. So they were quite... So that actually was my... I think uh, if we would uh, be united, uh, would be perfect situation. And um, yeah, maybe in a way it's possible if we will do it on the uh, human level and also on the level of um, uh, opposition or democratic um, people. I don't know. Security it, maybe also. Yeah, imagine if you would have this union, if you sum up our armies and the number of population, of course we will uh, be able to resist uh, Russia, uh, Russian invasion. Even if Belarus and Ukraine, mm -hmm. if unite these two countries, it's already enough uh, to defend ourselves politically and uh, military. But unfortunately, this is how this, um, this that's a very uh, important thing for the future that it's not only to change the Putin because there are people behind them. And I don't exclude that they might even uh, try to remove him to not to lose money, kind of, you know, we have new democratic liberal Russia, but um, we should not be blind because even if Putin uh, will be out, there are still people um, behind. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, I, that's um, my dream, uh, but I don't know how to come to this point because there are also a lot of disputes between the countries. Yeah, to, to add, like Putin, if, if, he, if he will vanish somehow, it's maybe there was someone next, but it's also into the population. There's also lots of people who have this imperial ambitions and think that we are great Russia. So also within the Russian society, there has something to change to to get uh, uh, have a friendly uh, relationship with their neighboring country. So it's not only Putin, it's also within the society. There has to be some kind of, like in South Africa, some kind of Wahrheitskommissie, or some like uh, in Germany after the Second World War, some kind of healing process. Reconciliation. Yes, that's, yeah. that's somehow they have to think by themselves, well, uh, this we have to go to another direction, yeah. into another road. One thing I, um, maybe to conclude, um, I saw um, from Koda's story, this, you, you had this uh, three episode documentary, um, and there's one priest, I think, he says, um, Russia as a united country cannot live on, so after Putin it will disintegrate. What do you guys think? Is there, if Russia loses this war, is there a, still a Russia, or will it fall apart? In, in, in different bits. I mean, let me let me get my crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. It's under the table. Um, look, that's a nice dream, but let's look at the map. Yeah. Let's just look at the map of Russia. It's not. A, it's not. Don't look anywhere because it's not here. Oh, okay. Just look at the map. <laughs> like that is a problem. <laughs> like unless Russia changes, uh, things will continue to be extremely problematic. So um, while I, you know, I'm with you, I like to dream that too. <laughs> you should the be. The reason oh. why we keep going back to Putin is because he's got us all hostages. Like mm. we are his hostages. That's why we keep talking about him. And it's not, it's not. It's become, it's, I'm using Putin as a collective name for the Kremlin establishment because there is absolutely... You know, no, no. People in Russia are not outraged about. Most people in Russia are not outraged about Russia's colonial ambitions, and most people outside of Russia are still not talking about Russia as a colonial power. They're talking about Russia as a big country that has a backyard and legitimate geopolitical interests. You know, that wouldn't fly with the United States, and United it wouldn't Kingdom. fly with the United Kingdom, or it wouldn't fly with Europe. But it. It, it continues to be that is the narrative and it's the narrative that is, you know, exists in Western societies that has to change. And it has to change among the liberal Russians as well, because, you know, when most liberal Russians I talk to, they don't think of their country as a colonial power. The way they relate to the Ukrainians, the little brothers, the Georgians, oh, basically a restaurant. Yes. Um, so, you know, I Bel yeah. use this, uh, this how I feel as well. Yeah, you know, Kazakhs, you know, oh, those wild nomads yeah, that we tamed, you know, all of that. And, and, and that extends to liberal Russians yeah. as well, who also need, and, it, it, and, and the Western societies need to 
think about it not as a, this is where Dasha is right, the NATO argument is a really, you know, most sort of potent weapon in Putin's arsenal. Um, because in the West, you know, Putin has successfully sold the narrative that Russia feels threatened. And somehow that narrative still dominates today, that NATO is a threat to Russia. Yeah. I mean, look again at the map. Yeah. How is NATO a threat to Russia? <laughs> Yeah. So Russia has a threat to the this, world. This idea that, like, uh, also a lot of Dutch people say that, yeah, but Ukraine used to be part of Russia, yeah, and the Netherlands used to be part of the German. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, it might be true, but I'm that saying. doesn't mean that it should be. Yeah. Um, yeah, Again, it's kind I of mean, like, understand, let's understand, why, like how Russia, yeah. poor Russia, you know, they're defending their interests. I mean, look at, yeah. look at them. And they have culture. And have called. I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, you know, I, I, I think you are absolutely right. I think all that process, like that process, Russia, Ukraine, not only Ukraine needs to win, but Putin needs to lose in Russia as well. And I'm pessimistic, unfortunately, um, about that. And that process of kind of rethinking that has not only not began, but, you know, the Russia has been thrown so far back into sort of that almost Stalinist thinking about itself. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's conclude it here. I will finish uh, the program for the camera and then afterwards we can have some uh, audience questions if there are here. Uh, I want to thank you very much for watching and we hope to see you uh, next time at the Bali. Uh, warm uh, applause for my guests. <laughs>